Welcome to the Psychology World Podcast. I'm O'Connor Whiteley, bringing you psychology news, articles and other interesting psychology related articles. Here where I can find the podcast notes and more interesting psychology related things and here where I can get your free 8 psychology book box set at ConnorWhiteley.net. Now let's get on to the show. Hi everyone and welcome to episode 108 of the Psychology World Podcast with me Con Wiley and today's episode is on how to stop rumination. So this is an absolutely brilliant podcast episode that I really enjoyed like writing about and like discovering because rumination as I'll talk about in the content part of today's episode is a massive like, negative problem but when it comes to mental health and it's something like that we need to stop. So this is a great podcast episode for clinical psychologists and university psychology students because this should help you recognise well, like, what tips then you might want to recommend to your clients. Though, right? Because the thing, yes, I the reason why I like, wrote this uh, is that if our client is uh, ruminating in the therapy room, that's all well and good because we're there to like, stop it. But the problem or the negative outcome is uh, what happens when they start ruminating outside of the therapy room. So hopefully though, right, this will be a really useful episode. And it is Friday the 27th of August 2021 as I record this. And even as I say that, I think it's really scary that we're about to enter the last third of the year. Yeah, that's really scary. <laughs> so, moving on to psychology news section. So, moving from the British Psychological Society Research Digest. And there are lots of good articles here, but we're only going to do three. Conspiracy theories are more entertaining than the truth. And this helps explain why people believe them. Conspiracy theories stroke anxiety and uncertainty and can even threaten the health of those who expose them. Take COVID-19 anti-vaxxers for example, who have put themselves at a risk by refusing a vaccine. So given those negative consequences, it's surprising that conspiracy theories are so prolific. Research shows that beliefs that other groups are colluding and secretly pursue malevolent goals the definition of a conspiracy theory, and more common during times of a crisis like a global pandemic, heightened anxiety is thought to lead people to erroneously believe that there are hostile forces at at a play. But now, a a paper in the British Journal of Psychology, there was another reason why conspiracy theories can be appealing. The team finds that conspiracy theories provoke a stronger emotional response than are relatively dull but true of reality, and this encourages people to believe in them, especially for people who have a personality trait of being sensation-seeking. So this, I think, is like, wow, and... And you I can really understand it. Well, for like example, if you take the COVID-19 anti vaxxers and please everyone, please just like, get your vaccine. I want you all like, to be safe. So if we take the COVID-19 anti vaxxers it's so boring if you just say that this vaccine is like, going to save your life. That's really true, but it's so boring. But then the more creative and then the more entertaining idea, though, where is that they, yes, is that the government is injecting you with microchips, which is probably one of my favourite um, conspiracy theories, because it's just like, really, is your life that interesting that they're going to, um, yeah, well, like, that the government is going to want to like, monitor you. For example, because I've been by myself for like this week, I've been, like, the most exciting thing that I've done this week in terms of like going out and what someone might want to like, monitor is like, like walking down the high street and just like doing some banking <laughs> yeah that's yeah well like, if someone that was like monitoring me through these like microchips then well they're going to be very bored so it's just so uh, silly but i do understand it and uh, yeah and it's just really interesting to like learn more about this so what uh, the next one is ability to name unrelated words is a good test of a creativity obtaining a solid measure of a creativity can uh, be hugely time consuming well-established tests such as the alternative use task, which asks participants to generate unusual ways to see common objects, require substantial time and effort in order to properly score participants' responses. Not only that, but assessment of a creativity of responses varies wildly as a result of both the scorer's judgment and the quality of answers related to the rest of the data. For example, one especially creative response amongst a sea of generic responses may gain extra points, place that same answer amongst other highly creative response, however, and is likely to score lower. But take heart, overstretched researchers. A new paper suggests that there may be easier, more reliable ways to test creativity. The divergent association task may be at least as effective at measuring verbal creativity as others more widely known creative measures. 
with the added bonuses of her being shorter, more enjoyable to participants, and be able to be scored by a, by a computer algorithm. Wow, okay, now that's a good one. Because, well, most of the people who have listened to this podcast either been to university, and I think we've all been there in these um, methodology lectures, and we're thinking... God, that seems so boring. That or like when we're reading a, a textbook, but then you have to get into the like, nitty gritty, and you can just see that some research methods are so dull and so long winded. So if there's a, a score that's actually quite easy to do but enjoyable, then that's also going to be really good. But then if we also think about this from our part pistons point over those uh, well, i'm not sure how it works in our other countries but generally in uh, the um uk when it comes to our university degrees uh, well of a course at least in our psychology uh, like we have to take part in our studies and i am ashamed to admit but if there's a really boring tasks i will just do it quickly to get out of there because i'm so bored and i just do not want to be in this experiment so of course uh, the data won't be as good as someone who actually enjoys it. So if we find more enjoyable tasks, then that's amazing. And that's what we've got to strive for in that strive for in the psychology. Of course, it's nowhere near that easy, but, uh, but it's just like, nice to think about. And we will do one more. Women and early career academics experience imposter syndrome in fields that emphasise natural brilliance. Imposter syndrome, the feeling that you don't belong or aren't capable at work or in education, can affect anyone. But people from underrepresented backgrounds are more likely to experience imposter syndrome. First generation university students, for example, or people of a colour. Imposter syndrome can be particularly acute in academia, where intellectual flair is a price. In fact, a new study finds that in fields in which intellectual brilliance is perceived to be a prerequisite for success, imposter syndrome is likely to strike women and early career academics. And this is actually quite interesting because I can like officially announce the project that I've been doing for like a few weeks. But I did a blog post for a university blog that I'm helping out with the online imposter syndrome, and I'll release it to this podcast um, next year because I'm going to do a like, mini-series though. But in imposter syndrome, it's really bad. And uh, to be honest, uh, the best tip that I can give you if you're feeling like in imposter syndrome, then you've just got to recognise that you are an amazing person and that no one is perfect. I'm not perfect. No one is perfect. So you've just got to stop these really high expectations because you are an amazing person and that uh, you all have your wonderful strengths and uh, weaknesses. For example, in the blog post, uh, and this is the last thing that I'll say on it, though, I, what I said was, was that, well, I'm going to know more than you in like, certain areas. You're going to know a lot more than me in like, other areas. So it's just like that. So I really hope that you enjoyed this psychology news section. So let's move on to the personal update. So I'm moving on to the personal update. So as I sort of like preluded to in the psychology news section, I've like, plus my parents have been like, a way up, like, I've been mainly like by myself, and I've always like gone out and I've done tons of different like bits and uh, pieces. Um, in terms of psychology, there's to be honest, there, there's only one exciting thing that I can announce, which I'm really, really pleased with because for the rest of it, I've uh, been doing like lots of like fiction and I've been doing tons of like other like little uh, projects. But I am extremely happy to announce by the time you listen to this on Monday, there will be five box sets on pre-order. And the reason why I'm so excited about box sets is because these are great collections of like my books that are available in our ebook and paperback form. I might do hardback, but I'm not sure. But the really exciting thing about it though is that, is that I've been formatting the box sets before I like send to, yeah, before I like send them off. And the exciting thing about it though is that they are massive, which I'm really pleased with, and I would love to see how big and how heavy my Ultimate Psychology collection is, which I contain like six of my books. That's like, if you want to know about the approaches to psychology, there's a social psychology box set, a clinical psychology box set, which I love, and an applied psychology box set, which I think is really, really good, and I really do like, enjoy like, putting that two together. And then there's an Ultimate Psychology collection, and even if you don't want to buy it, just look at the covers they're really nice covers and i'm really really pleased with what my cover designer did so amazing and like in case i've like piqued your like interest 
by the time you listen to this or the a week after, because I don't know how long it takes all of these different words to like, put up the books, so, well, all of these boxes are available on like, all major book retailers, so, well, retailers, and then at Euro, we can get the print books in all of the usual places. Though, so I'm really pleased with that, and these boxes will be great. So they're coming out in January next year. And as always, I always like, love to know your thoughts and feelings on today's episode. So you can always email me, conwhitely, conwhitely.net. You can always leave a comment on the show notes at conwhitely.net forward slash podcast. And you can always tweet me on Twitter at sci-fi whitely. I always love to hear from all of you. And today's episode has been sponsored by Cognitive Psychology, a guide to neuroscience, neuropsychology and cognitive psychology, a third edition. So this I really am looking forward to because it's currently on a pre-order and it's coming out on the 28th of September 2021. So this is a brilliant book and if you love like um, cognitive psychology which is about our mental processes then you will love this because it will really give you a deep understanding of cognitive psychology and also like how memory works, how will we think and like thinking biases but then it also but it also goes into a lot more depth too, for example, like how like vision works, how attention works. So there are so many great mental processes that I really am looking forward to you like reading though. So if you want a great, easy to understand guide that will really help you understand cognitive psychology, then I really do recommend it. So that is a cognitive psychology, a guide to neuro- neuroscience, neuropsychology and cognitive psychology third edition. Available in all major big retailers and you can order the print book from Amazon at your local books to all local library if you request it. And if you want to support this particular episode, if you really enjoyed a particular episode of the Psychology World podcast, then there's now a great new option where you can like give me money directly. Yeah. So if you want to do that, but then you can simply go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash Connor White today, and then you can like buy me a, a coffee there. So if you want to like support the podcast directly. And this is sponsorship that pays out for my time and the editing and the hosting of the podcast because it does take quite a bit of time. And this sponsorship helps cover the cost of producing the podcast. So well, let's move on to the content part of today's episode. So we're moving on to the content part of today's episode. So we're going to be talking about how to stop rumination. And what rumination is, is that it's when the exact same thought keeps going round and round in your mind. And in a clinical psychology, we sort of know whether this can be very negative because it can affect people's mental health. And as a psychology professional, if you are, and also if you're a university psychology student, then this might be helpful to know for the future. And to be honest, I think this is useful for everyone to know. Well, but then this can be helpful because uh, to give our clients tips about how to stop ruminating when it happens. So well, that's the aim of uh, today's episode. Why is ruminating negative? So before we dive into how to stop it, uh, what I wanted to mention uh, first of all was that rumination is really, well, is actually a really negative event for you to do with it uh, because it's not a, a problem and uh, it's not your fault that you're ruminating or your client. Uh, but it's just that if you keep ruminating, it will get you down and it will interfere with your problem solving abilities. And this alone is really, is really a bad though, because in psychotherapy, we need our clients to have their problem solving abilities so that we can work with them on improving their lives and alleviate their psychological distress. Because as we know, especially if you've read my formulation in a psychotherapy but a clinical psychology and psychotherapy, is about a working relationship between the client and the therapist. How to stop ruminating? So one of the possible ways how you can stop ruminating is that you will need to think about ruminating as a cycle where the client has a thought, be it a memory of an angry conversation or a negative event or something else in entirely, and the thought doesn't stop, meaning it goes round and round and round in their mind without it ever stopping, leading to extending rumination, which harms their mental health. So the way how you can stop this, or one of the ways, there are quite a few, but you can use cognitive absorbing tasks, which I don't think is a, like, a official term, but it does pop up in the literature quite a bit. So what these tasks are, is that they're tasks that are new to the client, so they have to focus on them and become cognitively absorbed into them, leading to a break in the cycle because the client is so focused on the new task that there isn't room in their mind to continue ruminating, and that's the general idea. So I really do like her, this idea because it is like, a little strange and a quirky and I always love a like strange or quirky idea but and what makes this even better is that we can use it to help people 
as well as another reason why I do but quite like it is, is that it's easy to do because it's very easy to do outside the therapy room and the problem or well or not the problem but the downside of most of psychology and most of the um, professionals is that everything that is helpful you sort of have to have specialized knowledge or you have to have some sort of specialized AI equipment but with this idea of a cognitive absorbing tasks, you actually don't need anything specialised or any specialised knowledge, meaning that this is perfect for our clients who might not know these are particular things that we do. I do though. And then like some of these examples of these is like any of the following. Now, but basically, a cognitive absorbing task is anything that is new to the client and would require them to focus on it. For example, drawing pictures from a book, making a model, following a tutorial on origami because that is very difficult i know that from personal experience building lego and my personal favorite which i don't recommend unless you have like lots of time is write a book <laughs> because that really does require you to focus on it but it's amazing fun any other way though so to conclude as a final point i just wanted to mention that whether or not you find the idea of one of these activities fun or not isn't the point and i know that sounds harsh but the entire point of these activities is to break the cycle of a rumination and then after you've broken the cycle you were, might want to do something more fun maybe even a productive because if you were or your client don't break the cycle then nothing might feel a achievable so then you might never do something fun and even a productive again though meaning that you will never or you will not for a little while alleviate the psychological distress and improve the client's life. So I really hope that you enjoyed today's episode and I hope that you learned something. I definitely feel like I learned something because I feel like if I'm ever ruminating then I know that I can just like use this technique in the future. And if you know someone who would find today's episode useful then please share it with them. I'm, I'm always really grateful when you wonderful people help spread the word about the podcast. And also please just check out Cognitive Psychology, a guide to neuroscience, neuropsychology and a Cognitive Psychology a third edition available in all of the usual places. I really do recommend that book, especially if you want to learn more about mental processes and thinking. And if you want to support the podcast directly, then you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com forward slash Connor Whiteley. So have a great day everyone and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to see the show notes, then please go to connorwhitesley.net. And if you want a free eight book psychology box set, then please go to connorwhitesley.net. Have a great day and I'll see you next time.